So I got to tell you, man, I've been watching your stuff. I've listened to you play. I've read your, all your stuff, all your PR and everything. And I got to tell you, man, and I mean this sincerely, you know, I, that you play like I think everybody that picks up a big fat jazz box wants to play. Yeah, I appreciate that. I really mean that. I mean, the, the tone is right. The feel is right. The phrasing is right. Yeah. The authenticity of what you're doing is right. It's just right. Mm. And you know how many guys, I mean, a lot of guys try to be that way, but you actually, you actually do it. You, you can, you got chops. You can play all the notes you want to, but you don't do it that way. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you phrase, you play musically. I do realize a couple of those things. Some of a couple of the things you said are like, uh, you know, like real okay. But two things that you said, the, like I know about the, the phrasing or the note choice or the kind of restraint or whatever you want to call it. And then the fact that I can do it, that's not lost on me. And that's something that really kind of an epiphany at one point, like being someone that aspired to this end or this kind of track, it ain't an end. It's not ended. I'm still, you know, I still feel insecure or whatever at various points about it. But being one that aspired to do it and right. to be able to do it as a youngster, you know, in the 70s and then coming into the uh, field in the 80s, and trying to find, you know, figure out who you are and what it all means. And you don't want to be seen as old school. You know, this was a little bit before the Young Lions. I kind of emerged on the scene along with those, you know, Winton and Branford and uh, Terrence Blanchard and those, that first iteration of the Young Lions. But I was a little bit removed because, I, I mean, I was in that group of guys. I knew them from having gone to Berkeley with some of them. And when they got to New York, you know, we all knew each other and just being the same age and going for the same kinds of things musically. But I also was in a group of guys that were playing like funk and instrumental R&B. And, you know, we were like, we don't want to just play bebop and we don't want to be old school, so to speak. But it was never like I was eschewing jazz, not at all, because that was my heart and soul, man. Even right. if I played, when I played, when I tried to play fusion, I never felt comfortable. <laughs> when I ever put like anything effects wise on my guitar, I never felt like it was my authentic voice. I always felt like I was kind of, you know, faking it a little bit, you know, no matter how good or whatever I sounded doing it, I never th thought it was real. It wasn't until my 30s, like early or mid 30s that I realized, hey, wait a minute, you know, I can speak this jazz thing. It's real. It's authentic. I, I believe it. I, I, I love, you know, and I, I feel like I can do it like pretty well. Yo, yeah. no, for real. Bobby Broom, wait a minute. Bob, Bobby Broom just said, I feel like I can do it pretty well. Yeah, and I'm thankful Come for on, that. Bobby. I'm thankful for that. I was like, it was like, really, it was like an epiphany. Like, you know, you ought to be thankful to, to be able to do it in the first friggin' place. Yeah. And then I thought like, okay, yeah, I am thankful. And then more than that, I feel like maybe I should honor this since I've been gifted with this. Right. I need to honor this. I need to embrace my gift and represent my gift. And that was like a day. I remember that day, man, I was practicing in my living room. <laughs> a lot of shit happened when I was practicing in my living room. I had epiphanies. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Amazing. Uh, I know what you mean about, you know, like I can play it, but it's just not me. I can't imagine you playing anything but what you do. I've had to do it in as much of a variety of ways as possible in order to eat. You did do that? I, I had to. Oh boy, well now, now educate me, yeah. man. I mean, it's been a difficult road because of the way that I began. I mean, the way that I entered the field was, who was I playing with? Dave Goose. And so when I made my first record, that was like a, before smooth jazz was a, a, a genre, before right. it was a category. That's what we were kind of doing. 
It was the precursor to that. It was you worked with Art Blakey, Max Roach, yeah. Stanley Turrentine, yeah. Kenny yeah. Garrett, Miles Frickin' Davis, Dr. Lonnie yeah. Smith, yeah. Charles Miles Hurley, Davis I wasn't playing Dr. Like John, guitar. Kenny Burrell, Ron Blake. <laughs> I wasn't playing a fat guitar with, with Miles. Ron Not Carter. Long shot. Miles I mean, wanted rock guitar. Miles wanted rock guitar. I know. Distortion and whatever else you could add to make it sound like Jimi Hendrix. Dr. John was all over the map, but his bass is blues, like for real, for real blues, I and, know. And, and, and like New Orleans R&B, you know, the, the precursor to like real rock and roll, the first rock and roll. Right. So, you know, I had to like d dig deep into whatever uh, my familiarity or lack thereof of that style. Man, I felt so uncomfortable on his gig, especially in the beginning, like after the third gig, I was like, Mac, man, if you, I said, I understand if you don't feel what I'm doing, I understand, I get it. And he was like, you know, he was a guitar player first and he loved jazz guitar. Yeah. And he was like, man, forget it, man. You sound fine. Like, I'll let you know if there's something wrong. You just do keep doing what you're doing. And I, that lasted for six years. But to me, when we would be playing the jazz, I uh, mean, a blues festival. Right. And like, um, Joe Lewis Walker, I think that's who it is. I'm going to look it up right now. But man, I don't know. I mean, it, was, it was, that was just one time. Any blues fest we did, and you know, these are real blues guitar players, and they right. come on and they'd be playing that authenticity, <laughs> like what you're talking about. I can do it jazz. They were doing it with the blues, and I'm up there faking it, and I could feel disparity was. You're doing was your. Uh... Oh yeah, they would. You know, I don't do that. Not for real. <laughs> you know, I got mine has an accent. Mine yeah, yeah, has a jazz accent, yeah. So yeah. I've done so many different things that for a while when I made, when I was, you know, coming, like trying to establish myself as a jazz guitar player, critics and journalists were still saying, yeah, but he plays funk. He's that funky guy. Oh, he's bluesy. He's a bluesy, yeah, yeah that, that, that guy. Like they wouldn't accept me like and say, this dude plays great. Jet, he plays great straight ahead. Uh, see, see, I, my filter's not that not that narrow. You know, I I sort of I sort of see it as this is blues through your eyes. This is funk through your eyes. This is you know not like oh he's a blues guy or he's a funk guy. You know, it's, it's coming through your your body through your filter through your mind. Well, you would hope so, but that's not. Well, that's the way I look at it anyway. The but they didn't see it like that back then. Now, no, no. it's probably popular to be diverse and like, especially if you play world, if you do world music, but it's well, different now. If you're out there wearing, um, you know, uh, Earth, Wind and Fire costume, <laughs> you know, doing that. But I, I, I think that the way that you were going about it, you know, you were still authentic to yourself, you're just playing that genre. You know what I'm saying? Right. I, maybe I'm not making any sense and maybe I'm just flat out wrong. I, I, you know, I've been wrong before, but it feels that way. I don't know, you just, you got a thing. Yeah, it, it was hard fought. I, I, that's the way I feel about it. It was, it was, it well, was hard those, fought. those names that I rattled off of people you played with, I mean, that's the, you know, that's the, uh, the who's who of, of jazz from that era, man. Right. You don't have any, uh, any apologies to make to anybody. I feel very blessed. I feel very blessed to see that list. Sometimes it's like, whoa, really? Did that happen? I mean, I know Did it I happened. Do that? I was there. But man, you know, there was a point where I was, man, I remember practicing as a kid in my room in New York. And, you know, I had a bunch of records by then and I was hell bent. I wanted to be one of those guys. This is what I wanted to do. And then one day it dawned on me again. I was, listen, I was in my room practicing and I, the thought hit me like, dude, you're not going to do that because these guys are already adults and they're doing it. And you're 15. You're not, you were born too late. That was one. <laughs> you're born too late. Not knowing really about how the music works and the mentoring and apprenticeship that's involved and how the music is passed through generations. I didn't, I wasn't thinking like that. I was just thinking like a kid, you know, and right. I got really, up, you know, it was upsetting to me, but then I thought, I don't care. You know, I'm just going right. to, I love this music so much. I'm just going to practice 
and I just want to learn how to play. If there's a way for like an imaginary kind of um, membership to this jazz thing, I want to be eligible for it. And I don't care what happens. Right now, today, we'll come up to today. You play, you know, I've, I've seen you with the guitar trio, you know, mm -hmm. bass, drums. And mm -hmm. I've seen you, or you do a lot of organ trio work. Mm -hmm. You also play solo guitar. Some. I try to. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, what, what's your, what, I mean, do you have a favorite or is it all just a different flavor? Or, you know, like some, some days you want to eat Italian, some days you want to eat uh, French. I mean, uh, what do you, what do you really like to do? can't really say. Uh, I know solo guitar is not one of my favorite things. I appreciate it when I do do it and it turns out halfway decent. Again, you know, rubbing yeah. the sweat off my brow and appreciative if I hear something that I think sounds okay. But I enjoy engaging uh, and interacting with other musicians. The trio setting has just been something that kind of happened over the years. You know, I wanted to have a guitar trio without another harmonic instrument, and that just evolved over time and, you know, a bunch of recordings. So that's that. And then the organ thing is kind of in the blood, in the lineage of jazz guitar. Right. You know, that whole instrumentation with... Everybody's got to do it. Yeah, it's almost like you kind of have to do it. And, and, and when I found myself doing it with the you know the first group that I had it was such a uh, such a high that it was like man you know this is it this is the which, 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 wait a minute, clear, that, clear was the deep, that was the deep blue organ trio oh the organ trio was the high yeah the deep the deep the deep blue organ trio yeah that was that was just for that sound and that style you know that just gave me the greatest feeling and then when that disbanded, I thought, oh, well, you know, I had a nice run with those guys and that'll never happen again. But then because of the Steely Dan call to open for them and they were really, they wanted me to do it, but I didn't have that band anymore. So I said I couldn't do it. And my drummer at the time, Micaiah McCraven, said, man, what are you doing? He called me on the phone. He's like, you can't not do this gig, man. <laughs> I was going to say, are you nuts? You I, well, I guess, you know, that's my, this, my stupid integrity or whatever. So he's like, man, let, I'm coming over or I'll, I'll, we'll get on the phone and we'll look at, through each other's phones right. and names. And so I said, okay, man, fine. You know, cause I was like, I don't want to just call any old body or just call somebody no. that I don't have a relationship with just to make the gig. So we went through our phones and we hit up on uh, Ben Patterson's name. And something just stirred in me, not ha ever having played with him. It was just a feeling. Right. And I'd seen him play in Chicago. He used to live here. And I thought, hmm, that might be something. I just remembered something about him. It was really vague. Like, I don't even know how I knew that would work. I really don't. But I followed through on the feeling and we got together and after a handful of gigs, it was like, bam, the, the synergy was. Tell people about that. You, you did a tour. Yeah, well, I did, you know, like Steely Dan is a, their big jazz. They were, you know, both of those guys when oh, yeah, I mean, Walter was alive, you know, I think that that's how they met. Well, oh, Donald and Walter may have met in college because him it had a, a connection through jazz music. They honor that to this day, and they often have, you know, jazz is a big part of their music. Oh, absolutely. They've done a great job of, of fusing it and kind of disguising it in a way. Yeah, but I, mean, they're, they're, their audience I, is, I think their harmony is the most advanced of all pop music. Yeah, their audiences are very sophisticated yeah. in that way. So they're not afraid to have jazz groups open for them. So many, yeah. probably, you know, a, a handful of the guitarists oh. you've talked to have been in groups that have opened for them. But um, I got a, we got a call, the Deep Blue Organ Trio got a call in, I don't know, maybe it was 2008 or something. We were kind of coming up and making records and getting a little, so we got this call and we played this uh, open for them at the theater in Chicago. And I thought we sucked, but you know, <laughs> you know, it was one of those like opening act situations where you come in in cold, nobody, they're looking at you like, who are yeah. these people? 
okay, I go on play for 20 minutes and okay, see ya. You know, so it was kind of like that. But we got a call again, maybe a year or less later. We've got, you know, and then that just kept happening. We've got a handful of dates here, a handful of dates there. Then next it was, you, you want to do a tour. So we did a summer tour with them. It was incredible. You know, I thought like, oh, this is going to be. What year was that? 2013. So 2013, mm -hmm. you're out. The summer tour with Steely Dan. Life is I good. Thought, I thought, oh, we're going to. I mean, you know, they've got all this equipment. So oh, here, yeah. We're playing amphitheaters, you know. I'm like, oh, we're going to tank, man. We have like three little dudes on the stage. Like, what? <laughs> can we come out there with that little, we're playing our little, I mean, we had, we were playing. We we, we played hard. Yeah, they did. That 20 minutes was like power. So, like, the people loved us. You know, the people would, you know, with some nights we'd get standing ovations and shit. And I'm like, what? Wow, cool. You know, that just goes to show you how sophisticated their audiences are, yeah. too. So yeah, we did that and that was that was great. And then we had we did a record, maybe it was around that time that was like number one on the jazz chart. So you know, we were living the life as much as a jazz person can, unless you're Kenny G, then you go to that next level. <laughs> but I mean, we were doing well. We were doing well, having fun. Here's the thing. You grew up in New York, or you, you, or so you, you were born in New York, you were there for a while, and then you, you went to Berkeley. You played with all these guys in high school. You were playing professionally. Most guys go, okay, this is it. I'm done, man. I got. But you went on to get a master's degree in jazz pedagogy. You call it, you you say pedagogy or pedagogy? Pedagogy, pedagogy depends on. Yeah, that. whatever, whatever. Yeah. So you went on to get a master's degree. A lot of guys, you know, they um, you know, they get gigging and that's it. They, that's kind of where they are. That's their life. But you, you know, took a really as far as you're gonna, you know, to, to all that way. And then a lot of people may or may not know that you do, you know, you're an educator. Well, you know, I've been an educator for pretty much the whole time, been a professional. It, it was maybe in 1982 or three that I got a call while I was still living in New York before I left. So I left New York when I was maybe 24. So, you know, as my career was being established, you know, I had done my first record and the whole thing and played with a bunch of people, you know, a handful of people. But I got a call from Jackie McLean, the great alto saxophonist, calls me out of the blue. I don't know how he got my number. He's the director of jazz studies at Hartford, University of Hartford. And he's like, I want you to come out and do these master classes. And I'm like, what's a master class? <laughs> I'm 22. I don't know. I, you know, I'm like, I, I, I haven't even finished college myself. I, I don't know what I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna be one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he says, just come on out. I'll take, you know, just talk to the kids and you know, they they and I'm like, man, I'm the their same age. He's like, it's okay, man, you're doing what they want to do. Just be yourself, be honest, show them what you can show them and be real. Right. And so I did that. I was doing that once a month, once every two weeks, twice a month. Yeah. And then the next year he said, hey, man, I want you to run the guitar program here. Dude, I can't do that. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. And he's like, it's okay, man. I'll help you. You'll, you'll be all right. And, and I, I turned him down. Oh, it, wow. It, integrity. I was like, I'm not equipped. And so I didn't do, man, I'd be retired now from this field. <laughs> I'm retired now. I was 22, 23 years old when he asked me to do that. If I was a capitalist, I would have said, hell yeah, I'll do it. And made it that money and faked it till I made it. But, you know, anyway, so I came at it this way. I continued to teach. I left New York for Chicago. I started teaching, I was an adjunct, and I stayed an adjunct for all those years. And at some point, I woke up one morning and I was like, yo, man, you've been teaching your whole life practically. You need to have a master's degree just to, like as a credential. Right. I had no aspiration for a full-time job. I just wanted it for personal reasons. And then several years later, I started looking around like, man, all these people have these positions in jazz and I deserve it and I'm equipped. Right. So, you know, I started to want one myself. <laughs> Eventually, through trial and error, I, I landed one. Man, that's so cool. I got to tell you. It is pretty right? cool. It is. That is so cool. Especially now during COVID, it's really cool. Yeah, but... <laughs>
It's really cool. And I mean, besides COVID, it's really cool. Yeah. You know. So I mean, it just changes the it changes the landscape of what I do, uh, why I do what I do. Okay, ultimately, why I do what I do is because it's this burning desire to just be who I am and right. fulfill that no matter what, you know, no matter how little money I'm making, no matter how much I have to invest in my own success or career or whatever it is, how to self-produce my records or, but you know, no matter what, I'm in it for the long haul. So that has its ups and downs and peaks and valleys like anything else, but it certainly has its difficult times where you wonder, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? This is like, I'm never gonna have any kind of benefits. How am I gonna, what am I gonna do when I'm, you know? Right. And I'm, you know, I just turned 60, so I'm looking 70, oh shit, 75. Okay, now my parents were cool till they were, probably close to 90, but I'm, you know, knocking on wood. That's still not as far away as it used to be. So, you know, oh, you man. have these thoughts, but ah, whatever. The way that I arrived at this situation, which is, you know, a blessing, was honest, was right. not calculated. It was just, it, it's part of the gift. I've been gifted a lot in this life. Right. And this is another one of those situations where it couldn't have happened at a better institution, at a better time. I feel like, you know, I always dreamt that, oh, I'll find a place. I, I, well, I didn't know that I would, but I, I wanted a place where I could be myself, be a jazz musician. I, you know, I would be supported in that. Like, where does that exist? I don't know of too many of too many institutions in academia where that is actually the case. I seem to have found one. You know, when you have a little bit of money, you know, you got that income coming in, it gives you options. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's like, okay, so there was the burning desire, the artist that right. was going to just fulfill my uh, obligations to that as best I could, no matter what. Unfortunately, you know, I'm married to, uh, uh, I, my wife is like thoroughly supportive and, and, right. and, 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 you know, just of me and who I am and what I'm like, she's, you know, never complained and made me feel like she always supported me in being exactly who I am and doing exactly what I need to do. That's fantastic. And she would say, we need to do. She That's would say, yeah. whatever we need to do so that we don't look back one day and say, I wish we had done this and maybe this would have happened. Meaning about my career, right? right? So like, I've, I'm blessed in that way as well. Okay, so, but now I'm in a situation where it's not like I have to do gigs or just perform because to pay the bills, I'm helping pay the bills, but I still need to perform because part of the, the not part of well yeah um, the main part of the reason why i got this position was because of my body of work in the field performance my recordings my artistic endeavors like you know i was told yeah okay here are your duties do what you do be an artist teach and service to the uh, academic community <laughs> art institution I'm like, really? And they're like, in that order. I'm like, really? So wait, not teaching's not first? I couldn't believe it. So let, let's, move into, let's move into some uh, guitar stuff for a minute. So what instrument do you play? What, what guitar is that? Let's talk about your, your actual guitar. So it's, it's a, a cane top, K-O-E-N-T-O-W-P, right. Chicagoan is the model. Right. Danny made, made handmade, you know, he hand makes all this stuff. Well, I, uh, I met Danny a couple years ago when we were out in uh, Colorado. Yeah. Right. So right. he made this thing. Uh, I went to him because I was hearing more. I wanted to hear more out of the note. I wanted richness, character. And so I thought, well, maybe I need one of these like fancy arch tops. You know, I was never, I never had an L5. I 
you know, I was never really that kind of guitar geek guy. I right. just played what I played and whatever, trying to make it sound good. But so I met with Danny since he was still living in Chicago. This was right before he moved to Los Angeles. So we met. Well, you know, I sat with him, we talked, I played, he watched me play, and he was like studying everything and measured my then guitar. I was playing a Hoffner, Jazzica, and uh, he measured that. And then he's like, okay, you know, I've got a couple of projects I got to do. And so it'll be, you know, eight, nine months before I get started. But then we talked again a couple of times, a few times over the phone, and he did it. And immediately I was in love with well, it. Well, you can tell that you're like bonded with that instrument, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's definitely me. And then obviously you go, you it's a straight wire into an amp, and so what amp are you using these days? Oh, you know, I've been using Henriksen for, whoa, Ah, what was that, like 2007 or something? So yeah, it's getting Which to be model a do you use? Which well, model? I've gone through, he can't, he doesn't stop making them. So I, you know, <laughs> yeah, so he, you know, I just played whatever he makes, I play. But the last time I saw, you know, in Colorado, I, I was on the verge of getting a, some kind of Fender tube amp, deluxe or something. I don't know, I was looking into things and then I, I went down to Colorado and uh, Peter says, hey, I got this this new amp you should check out. It's got a tube in it and you know, you." and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And when I played that, I was like, oh, that's it. Cause I don't need all tubes. I just need a little bit of that. I've, I've never been a tube guy. So that's perfect for me. So yeah. that's what you're taking out of the Forte? Yeah. So, you know, obviously things are shut down and have been shut down for a while, you know, mm -hmm. with, the, with the COVID thing. You know, God willing, and I hope he's willing that we're come this summer, things yeah. may start looking like, well, not like they were, but they're going to start looking more like they were. So yeah. you got any, you got any, anybody talking to you about gigs coming forward? Any, any, is that opening it up for you at all? No, I mean, I'm taking, I heard a little from an agent that I work with about pursuing some, she's going to pursue some things, but no, but I'll tell you. I don't know, you know, like, so with teaching, I'm so busy. And then things that come up are, I don't feel, I mean, I feel like it's, I've been okay. I've, you know, I've, I don't play all the time, but I play enough. And the things right. that I do are um, significant. Yes. You know, and, like that thing you did with Gary Motley. I mean, you know, that was freaking awesome. That was, it was serious and yeah, it was serious was work. That yeah, was a lot well, he's, you know, as we were saying. Yeah, I, you know, I did three cameras and recorded it into the DAW and the yeah. whole thing, you know. So thank goodness well, I'm, you're... I'm able to do that. So I'm able to do that. That's the cool thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm digitally literate. So, you know, I'm working on a, I've been working on a record since the beginning of COVID. And it so, is um, not anything like anything I've done before. What little mountains are you working on right now, climbing up and... The thing about it, uh, the, where I'm at now is, um, you know, I, and I've always been this way, I think, since since some point in my adulthood where, and maybe always, where I am, I'm okay with the information, much like the events in my life slash career right. occurring naturally. You know, so I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, constant student and music lover and fan listener um i don't listen as 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 avidly or like you know go after chasing after every new thing or not you know not like i used to when i was younger i don't practice with the same that same kind of intensity that i used to when i was younger at some point that waned and there are spurts where I go at it hard and then other times where things happen and osmosis inspiration will occur. I'll hear something, I'll think of something, something will come up in music that will compel me to follow it or whatever. So there's that. With my, with my uh, teaching, I'm always, I'm so on my toes. I have to be on my toes. With my students, I've got some students that are playing their asses off. I got a 20 year old that's, forget it. If I'm not on my game, 
I'm going to be in trouble, you know, like what, so I have to contend with that, the fact that he's there for me to help elevate him, and so I have to honor that, uh, and this, everybody's different, I've got 10 students, and everybody's a little different, so it requires a lot of uh, ingenuity and improvisation, and I have to, you know, iterations of what I understand and what I know and how I can deliver it, and it's incredible, that well, you, part you, of you it. You have a responsibility to inspire them. Yeah. They're counting on you to, they got to do it for themselves, but they're counting yes. on you to kind of show them the way to do it. I mean, you know, I mean, you've been doing this a long time, you know what that's they're, like. They're also counting on me not to be, I think, not to be a relic. They oh, can, absolutely. You know, to be, I have to remain active. So that is keeping me active. It's keeping me inspired. Um, my own pursuit is still there. The fire is still there. You know, I've been working on a record since the beginning of, co before COVID started, just a little bit before COVID started. A childhood friend of mine, uh, the drummer I was speaking of earlier, Pooji right. Bell, he was in town and we met and he s plays me some of the music his, from his new record. And he says, what are you working on? And I said, well, you know, I got a couple of things that I'm either doing or thinking about doing. He says, you know, and I'm looking at him like, what do you got on your mind? And he says, well, I'm thinking, you know, uh, you want to do something together. And I said, well, if it's anything like what you played for me, absolutely. Because oh, it's wow. a direction. It's a direction that I've been trying to find a way to go toward. And this is apparently but it. You're working, so, on, you're working on that now? We're working on that since that time. And then like two or three weeks later, boom, lockdown. But the cool yeah. thing about it is that it's a remote project. So right. he's doing stuff electronically, sending it to me. I work on it. I farm it out to different players. Wow. And it's beautiful. It's, it's really, it's exciting. It's exciting. I mean, this has been, it's really fun to talk to you. I appreciate and I really appreciate it. I mean, you're, yeah. you, you know, I, I paid you some high compliments earlier and I meant them from my heart. I mean, you, yeah. you are the real deal. You know, I, I was going to ask you one more, one little question about, about playing because jazz guitar today, we address everybody from the guy that's playing pentatonic scales, if he's, mm -hmm. you know, to the guy that's, you know, extremely advanced and all of that. For the guy that's, you know, wanting to learn how to play jazz he's been playing a long time I'll say he plays blues but he wants more language what's the first what, give me give him a little tip what's the first thing you would tell him to do one the main thing and i say this every day now is the listening component oh wow it's yeah so underrated and the answer because ultimately what we are all trying to do i think I know what I'm trying to do, I'll just keep it personal, is play what I imagine in the moment. So that has to come from, you know, imagination much like, you know, and you think of your, you know, you're acting. Right. You can't play a role that you don't envision. Right. You have to put yourself in the, right? I can't imagine anything that I haven't experienced, not really. So music is the same thing. If you haven't heard something to the extent that it is something that you can remember, imagine, or something along those lines, there's no way that you can hear anything right. to like make up in a moment. So you have to feed your brain what it is you want to do. Career-wise, guys that want to learn how to break into playing now right now it's a hard time to say that yeah. but I, you know what i always tell people is you know you got to learn how to not only you get you're learning your instrument learning the, the repertoire that's one thing mm -hmm. but learning how to get along and be a be somebody that people want to hang with on the road and on the stage right that's something right. else yeah i mean you know that's it's it's a big part of it and it, I, I think that there is some correlation between just like normal relationships, how everybody doesn't get along. Right. Some people like a certain kind of person. Other people like a different kind of person. 
I think that is the same with music and even like kind of is a reflection within someone's music making or who they are as a musician and what their music is. And I think it's all related. I don't know how sounds kind of esoteric, but I believe that it. I've got one last question for you. Um, and it has to do with Miles. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I have, we've interviewed uh, Schofield, mm -hmm. uh, Mike Stern, mm -hmm. uh, Robin Ford. Right. About was time favorite. with Miles. He was my favorite with Miles, as a matter of fact. Robin I don't Ford. know if we want to print that. I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah. With that yeah. band for something for for some reason, man. When I heard him with that band, I was like, ooh. Mm -hmm. you know, his, we're talking about Robin Ford. So, you know, he says, Man, I, I, I you know, I'm a blues player, man. <laughs> he said, you know, and they all say the same thing about working with Miles. The, the, I, I interviewed, you know, I've interviewed, they all said, you know, there's no charts, there's no rehearsal, there's no nothing. No. It was one, two, three, it, they're all vamp tunes at those in those days. Yeah. No. Absolutely. That's what it was. Experience? That's what it was. It was when, when were you there? 87. Yeah, I did like five gigs with him in 87, right after Hiram Bullock, I believe. So right. I'm like, first of all, I'm going like, I know what Hiram sounds like for that. He's one of my idols. Yeah. And I know what Miles wants. You know, I've heard the bands. I was, you know, heard all of the bands live. And I'm like going, I am not that. But buddy of mine that I just talked to before I got on the phone with you, uh, got on here with you, Daryl Jones, a bass player who's from Chicago, lives wherever in LA, played with the Stones for the last 20 something years or whatever. He, the drummer who was Miles' nephew, who's from Chicago, nobody lived here, but the, the, the keyboard player, Bobby Irving still lives here. And they're all, you know, Chicagoans. So they come, I, my name, my name came up and they came and got me from a gig. Like, I'm like, what are y'all doing here? Looking like the mob. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the table, like, I'm like, what's up? Something's up. <laughs> they're right. like, hey, Miles wants you to, to, to send him a tape. Wow. Well, I'm like, okay. So I go home, go to my home studio and cook up my best Fake rock and roll. <laughs> the best fake rock and roll I could come up with, right? <laughs> so I sent him the tape. And he probably knew, but he was like, tell him to come to New York. So I went to New York. I had still had my apartment in New York at the time. Yeah. And, uh, so I went home and, you know, did, did the rehearsals and did the gig. Got the itinerary and was on the band, in the band. So. But it was, it was so, you know, it was loud. It was me playing distortion and, you know, right. ah, there's a tape floating around <laughs> on the internet. There's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a tape on the internet floating around. I, and in fact, somebody directed, it, directed me to it recently and I listened to as much as I could stand, which was like five minutes. So um, two things. First of all, at that very time, I had I just made a record with Kenny Burrell when he put this band together that I mean I was kind of the inspiration or part of the inspiration for this band was the fact that you know an incident occurred and I wound up being asked if you can imagine to sit in with Kenny Burrell like kind of as a retribution or you know payback they, the person felt bad for what they had done so they invited me to come to sit in with Kenny Burrell as a, like a way to make, you know, to appease or, you know, kind of, you know, make right, it happen. Yeah. So I did, you know, like I went and played and, and he liked me. So he came back to Chicago six months later and said, he want, I want to do a, a, a three guitar frontline thing with a rhythm section. So I'm like, okay, cool. So we did oh, that. Wow. And then six months later, he says, man, I want to do this for real. And I'm putting a band together, together called the Jazz Guitar Band. And you're in it. And you and Rodney Jones are in it. And so it was me, Kenny, Rodney Jones. We did these, like, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is um, I got us a record date with Blue Note, Blue Note Records, live at the Village Vanguard. Wow. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, live at the Village Vanguard for Blue Note Records with Kenny Burrell. 
So, okay, I was 27, 26, 27. Right at that time, so we did the record, everything was great. Then I get the gig with Miles. Like, how much of a dichotomy could that be? It was like two ends of the jazz spectrum. Yeah, right. Kenny's straight ahead. That body jazz guitar, straight ahead as straight ahead can be, and Miles playing Human Nature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is where I was. This is why people were like confused about me. Like, who is this? What is this dude doing? He's like doing this over here and he's doing that. I mean, you know, that's how yeah, I you perceive know, I'm gonna tell you, I mean, I mean, we just lost, obviously just lost Chick Korea, man. And, you know, I mean, right. look, look at the different things he did. I mean, you know, but he's that's still- Chick, That's Chick Korea. Some people have that luxury can't be a jazz guy because he did this and that and that and i'm going no listen to what i'm playing right right now and they're like uh oh, whatever <laughs> hopefully those days are long gone right? but well, i do I, I understand yeah. what you're saying i, I, fought, I, through, I yeah. fought through that crap well people you remember the old days people used to say you know put you don't put me in a box don't put me you know right you know, right. Like you don't want to be. And now it doesn't matter to me anymore because I think I've established a certain, right. you know, I've established something about who I am and it is what it is. So when people hear this next record, I don't give a crap what they say. <laughs> when they hear it, they're going to be, they're going to be a bit surprised, but maybe not given my past. They might oh, be man. like, well, we figured he had to go back and do something crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I look forward to I look forward to hearing that for sure. It's it's going to be nice. <laughs> Listen, Bobby, thank you so much for doing this tonight. Hey man, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate what you're doing. Honor. Bobby Broom, guitar player, just magic, extraordinary. All those words, man. The, the, I, you know the real deal. I mean, all the all those crazy oh. expletives, you know. But you really are, and I, I mean it from my heart. Do you ever see this West Montgomery interview? And he's talking, and it's so funny because they're smoking cigarettes during the yeah, interviews, right. like when you can smoke inside and sit in front yeah. of people. So they're talking and smoking, and Wes is saying how people listen to him and they don't really consider him or they don't like really deal with him as much as a guitar player. Right. And I can totally relate to that because I feel sometimes like the instrument is so baffling all the time it's like what you know i've got things that i can do but it's still so complex yeah. i'm bob baker jazz guitar today bobby broom the man who can manifest great music <laughs> <laughs> thanks bobby i appreciate it good Thank night you, now. Bob. all Thank right you, man. all right bye. stay healthy later bye bye